so much for inviting me to do this uh, webinar and have the opportunity to talk to you all about some of the work we've been doing. And before we start, I'd actually just like to find out how many of you uh, were at the presentation with Giles this morning from the Centre for Whale Research. So I'm going to have a little try here, and if I can use the poll, ah, we were. Let's see, if I start this poll, can you guys fill in? We were, okay, so two of you, yes. Maybe we don't need the poll. Okay, fantastic. Well, that makes my job here a lot easier because uh, if you guys have already seen some of this information before, then we can get on to the uh, really exciting stuff, which is the science as well as the killer whales. So I'm gonna stop that close for all. Okay, great. So. I want to tell you about how we've been using this fantastic data that the Centre for Whale Research have been collecting to ask some really important questions about evolution and about the evolution of reproduction, so decisions individuals make across their lifespan about when to reproduce, and menopause, menopause in humans, which is females stopping reproduction partway through their life. And from an evolution perspective, that's really puzzling. Why should individuals stop reproducing when actually we think evolution will favor them to keep reproducing until the end of life. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. Let me see if I can advance the slide on. So a little bit about the structure of the talk, so you know a little bit about what's happening and uh, where we're going. So I want to tell you a little bit about where I am. I'm in Exeter in the UK, where the whales are, but you will know a little bit about that from listening to Giles. Um, a bit about menopause and why it's interesting. So why are we so fascinated about this very unusual life history where females are stopping reproduction partway through life? And then why this might be happening and how we've been using that long-term data from the center to try and understand how this trait can evolve. So we'll ask three questions. Do grandmothers benefit their family group? Uh, how do grandmothers help? But then importantly, why do they stop reproducing? And throughout this talk, um, I'd like you guys to kind of think about what the potential conservation implications of this is for marine mammals and conserving marine mammals. When Giles was talking earlier on today, those of you who were able to listen to Giles talk, um, you'll have realized that there's only 78 individuals left in this southern resident killer whale population. So they're really endangered. And I'd like you guys to think about how we might be using this research in order to try and inform future conservation. Okay, let me click on again. I will get the hang of this eventually. So that was just a reminder to me to ask you guys about conservation. Okay, so uh, I'm in my office. and um, Let's see if this works. I want to show you where my office is. So if I start the video player, hopefully you guys are going to be able to see this. And click here. So hopefully a video is going to start if I press play. Okay, so this is just from Google Earth. So uh, if I click on here, hopefully you can see my pointer here. We're flying into England. I'm in the southwest of England down here. And this is now, I'm in this building. This is the Department of Psychology in the University of Exeter. And my office is just here. This beautiful old uh, Victorian building. Nice grass field in front looking out into the countryside behind the city of Exeter here. And we're going to zoom out here, and for those of you that are able to actually make Charles's talk, we're going to find our way to the Centre for Whale Research. So now we're zooming out the United Kingdom, and we're going to go across the Atlantic here, all the way over to the Pacific coast of the US, and the Centre for Whale Research here. And so it's the Centre for Whale Research here on uh, San Juan Island, In here is the sea where the whales are swimming in. Um, and these are the guys that have been really collecting the data on these killer whales that we've been using, and this is where we go to do our work on the killer whales. Okay, let me go back to the slides. So, Giles will have told you a little bit about this, so I, I won't dwell on this for too long. And, by the way, please feel free to put questions into the box or to ask me to explain things, or if anything's not clear, please let me know, and I'll quite happily uh, go into a bit more detail or, or go over things again. So feel free, I enjoy getting questions while I'm speaking, so feel free to ask me questions. Um, so we've been working with these two populations, the northern and southern resident killer whales. Here you can see Vancouver Island and um, 
click on again. And the Southern residents, as I said, when we got started, unfortunately now are down to just 78 individuals. The Northern residents have um, just, just short of 300, so they're a much bigger population. And again, Giles may be covered this, but the Center for Oil Research really, or the long-term study really started in the 60s and 70s when these animals were taken into captivity. And during the 60s and 70s, around 66 whales were either taken or killed from these populations. And that had a disastrous effect, especially on the southern resident killer whales. Ken Balcom uh, and a number of other people around that time actually started realizing this was a finite population and they needed to collect data on how many animals there were. If animals were kept being taken from these populations and harvested, actually they realized the populations would disappear. So they started counting the whales. And in 1976, 1976 Ken Balcom here established Orca Survey. And Orca Survey, as you've heard from Giles, is going on today. And and I really just can't stress how unusual and how unique that is to have this incredibly long-term data set on individual animals that have been tracked throughout their life, especially for marine mammals. So we have these data sets for some primate populations, for some ungulate populations, for terrestrial mammals, but it's really, really, really unusual to have this long-term data for a marine mammal. And this is especially the case that facilitates this is the fact that the killer whales are resident. So Giles will have told you about this this morning. They're returning to the same place to feed every year. And because of that, the same individuals have been able to be tracked throughout their life. Uh, how, how do they, what type of data uh, do they collect? Well, they have um, information on, on births and deaths, as we'll see here. So if we just look at one case, and, I, and I'm not sure if Giles has shown you these slides already, but we'll click through them quite, quite quickly. So if we look at J32, it's an animal in J-Pod that was born in 1996, and this is the calf in the year of birth. And we can click through, and every year the population is censused. And by doing that, we can track the development of this animal through its life, now as a three-year-old, now, as a five-year-old, you can see the animal starting to increase in size as the mother behind significantly larger. A nine-year-old here, interestingly, uh, starting to develop some uh, skin uh, abnormalities here, and that, that's an interesting question as to, as to what's causing that. Um, moving on now, as a 13-year-old, so these animals are becoming sexually mature at about 13, so this is now an, an adult whale. Um, again, tracking this whale through to 2014, so two years ago. And this is the last photographed encounter with J32. And again, I just highlight this unusual patterning on her skin. And unfortunately, uh, J32 in early December in 2014 was, was found dead. And the, the animals are rarely found dead, actually. Most of the time, they, they sink or they're lost out at sea, and they don't, they don't actually be able to recover the animal. But what this does is it actually enables, allows us to collect information on the births of animals and how long they survive. And that's incredibly valuable for us. And, and let's just go to a video. Um, if I go to the video player, and if I just click on here, and we'll actually see. So here, this is. Uh, the type of data we've been able to use from the center. Uh, oh, were, were we able to determine the cause of death? Um, from the dissections, um, they were able to determine the cause of death. That's a really good question. I would actually need to go back and look at my notes to remember what the cause of death was. So I, but I will answer that question for you uh, later on. But in this video here, what I wanted to do was just highlight this newborn calf that will pop up uh, in the frame here, and you will be able to see a. How did you become interested in studying whales? How did I become interested in studying whales? I became. I've been fascinated in studying animals since I was a little boy, and there's a little calf just popped up in the middle of the screen there. I became interested in studying whales because um, I had a PhD student, so somebody doing a doctorate degree 
who was fascinated by whales and really became passionate in following, uh, studying whales for her PhD. And I agreed to, to supervise her studies. And within a, a few weeks of doing so, I also got hooked on whales. They are absolutely incredible animals with fascinating lives that can tell us a great deal about ourselves. OK, so this is the type of information we can get, information on who's swimming together in a group. Uh, and from that information, I want to tell you about some of the signs that we've been able to do. So let me stop this video now and go back to the slides. OK. So uh, what, what emerges from this data is a very unusual family life where um, we, from these information on births and deaths, we're able to draw uh, what looks like a family tree. So a tree of relatedness with the female at the top and her offspring and then her offspring having offspring. But what's unusual about these killer whales is that neither sons or daughters disperse from their family. So both sons and daughters live in their mother's group her entire life. So in mammals, that is an extremely unusual pattern of dispersal or lack of dispersal. And actually, we're only aware of two species that have this. And both of them are toothed whales, so the killer whales and the short fin pilot whales. In all of the mammals and birds, either males or females disperse. So this is very, very unusual. And for us, this is what makes killer whales especially interesting in understanding why this is evolved and what the consequences of this is for some behavior and evolution that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to show you a few plots like this. And uh, they may be new to many of you, so we'll talk through what they are. Um, and hopefully, they're relatively easy to understand when you know what the plot's showing. So along the bottom here, we have age. And this is age in years. And on what we would call the axis, so this is the y-axis of the graph, this is this direction, we have something called survival, or the probability of survival. So at age zero here, all animals are alive, but just they have a survival probability of one, which just means they're all alive. And as animals age, their probability of survival decreases with time. So as this starts to get to less than one, that means that these whales are dying, and they have a higher chance of dying the lower down we go. So it's very rare for males, these are the blue circles here, to get older than 40 years. The oldest male we think got to around 60 years old, whereas females here we can see live into their 80s and possibly, I said possibly, we, we don't know exactly how old the oldest female was, but J2. Uh, was possibly over 100 years old, but definitely over 80 years old. So this is already very interesting, because already we can see a difference here in survival between males or females, with males dying at a much younger age here than females. OK, so if I click this on one, what's interesting, and this really emerged from this long-term study, this long-term data, is that these females are only really reproductive for this very short time. So you can see here along this axis, hopefully you can see my arrows. I'm moving it around the screen. Uh, I'm moving it on my screen, and hopefully you can see that. And um, if you can't, let me know, and I will uh, try to explain this in a different way. If we look up here, we can see this green bar here. Females are only reproductive uh, between around their mid-teens, so from when they're 15, around till uh, their mid-30s until their 40s. That means they're having calves during this part of their life. They terminate reproduction here, so they become post-reproductive. They have their last calf around here. Yet they have this time period here where they're still alive, but they're no longer having offspring. And as I will show you in a second, that is really, really, really unusual to see. Uh, humans have a very similar pattern, as we'll see, but most animals reproduce until the end of life. And so this period here is when the whales are post-reproductive. So the females are no longer reproducing. But note, by this point, most of the males have died. So it's just these females are living a lot longer than males, and they have this period where they're not reproducing. So they're post-reproductive. And this is, the, this is a uh, plot. Again, we're going to see a, a few of these plots. So this is um, the red on this plot is survival. 
So this is the same type of plotter we've just seen. It starts at one, and it goes down to zero. So here, all individuals are alive. Here, nobody is alive. And um, we can see that everyone is dead in this hunter-gatherer society uh, by around 75 or 80. Um, and this is fecundity, which is when females are having children. This is a human data set. And that peaks in the in midlife, but again drops off to zero in late life. So there is this period here where females are also post-reproductive. They're not having any children in late life. And so we have grandmothers in human societies. Uh, females have their last child in their 40s typically, and then may live until their 80, 90, or over 100 years. So very similar to the killer whales. I said it's unusual, and just to just to illustrate this, we can look at some other species here. So we can look at some primates, and we're going to see the same plot. So this is survival and and births. We're calling this fecundity. So this is animals having giving birth to offspring. And if we if I just flick through these now, and we can we've got the names at the top. Uh, the thing to compare here is to look, and the blue line now is higher than the red line, and it extends until the end of life. So in these plots here, females are reproducing until the end of life. They're not stopping early as they did in the humans here. Females have offspring until the end of life. So the reproductive lifespan is as long as the total lifespan. And for most animals, it looks like this. It looks like patterns where females reproduce until the end of life. In humans, we see this pattern. It was argued at one point that this was just simply an artifact, a consequence of the fact we now have medical care, we have hospitals, we live longer. But the fact that we see the same pattern in the killer whales shows us that actually this, this can evolve by evolution. So this, this isn't just an artifact of our long lifespan. And this actually can be the result of evolution and natural selection in, in, uh, was developed by Darwin. So the interesting thing about whales and tooth whales in, this, in, in particular is that we've seen this plot for the killer whales. So this is showing females having their calves in midlife, but living uh, way past the age that they last have a calf. The same pattern we also see in this other species, the short fin pilot whale, which is also a toothed whale. So there's two types of whales. There's the baleen whales that feed on plankton. Uh, and there's the small, little small organisms that live in the sea. And there's the toothed whales that tend to feed on fish or marine mammals. And in another toothed whale, we also see this really unusual pattern. And But it's not for all marine mammals that we see this. So the long fin pilot whales, for example, they keep, the females keep breeding. This blue line is above the red line all the way until the end of life. So what we have in marine mammals, which in terms of biodiversity is absolutely fascinating, is we have two species that have evolved very similar life history. And life history are it's looking at reproduction across an animal's lifespan. So the females here stopping breeding partway through life, very similar to humans. And this is something we would call convergent evolution. And convergent evolution might be a new term to, to many of you, or perhaps to all of you. And I can just pull up this figure here to illustrate what I mean by convergent evolution. So here we can see two, in this figure here, we can see two very similar looking structures in the natural world, a wing of a bat and a wing of a bird, but they've evolved separately. So they've evolved independently. The bats and the birds both evolved this wing independently of each other, but they evolved very similar solutions to the same problem. We know because we know about the evolutionary history of killer whales and humans that they have evolved this trait separately. So they don't share a common ancestor, but actually they've evolved this same pattern of reproduction. And it's understanding why these killer whales, unlike most of the mammals, stop reproducing partway through their life, that we've been really interested in unraveling that in our research. So the first question, really, and, and you asked me uh, 
you know, what, what got me interested in the whales and how did I start studying them? As soon as I found out that these females were having their calf, last calf in their 40s, but potentially living until they were 100 years old, I just had to try and understand why. I, uh, I, from, from being a small child, I have a very curious, uh, curious nature to, to asking, question, asking the question why. And for me, this was just a really exciting question. Why on earth should females have their last calf, but yet live for a significant time period, possibly 60 years afterwards? And that's a real puzzle, because we think of evolution as favoring individuals increase the transmission of their genes and their genetic material to the next generation. And the most obvious way they can do this is by having lots of offspring, lots of their own offspring. We are related to our offspring. On, I've got two children, and on average, each one of those children share 50% of my DNA. So if I want to increase the, the transmission of my DNA, the transmission of my genes, the obvious way to do that is by having more children. So why on earth could evolution favor a species that doesn't do that and it actually stops reproduction early? Okay, so if I, if I click on now. Um, so in, in killer whales, we can ask that question, but to understand the answer, we, we need to know a little bit about their family life. And killer whales swim around in something called a matriline, and that's a, a family group that's based around a female. And we can tell the males and females apart. The males have these long uh, extended dorsal fins, and then females tend to have these short ones. So we can tell males and females apart. Males are bigger than females. Um, they swim around in these matter lines where the sons and daughters stay with their mothers. But they mate with individuals from different groups, and then they return to their own group. So they don't mate with their siblings. They mate with individuals from different groups. So what that means is if a daughter reproduces, if a female reproduces, her calf is reared by the group she is in. If a male reproduces, then the calf is reared by a different group. But the male goes back to his own group. So they have this very unusual family structure. And this, because of this, we would predict that these post-reproductive females, so these old females, should help their sons rather than their daughters because if their son reproduces another group rears the calf where if a daughter reproduces the own, her own group has to rear the calf so this is another mouth to feed in the group if a son reproduces the mouth is in a different group so we predict that these old females should preferentially help their sons rather than their daughters and with this really long-term data set, we can start to test these predictions. Um, we've already seen a video showing the data collection. This is we can we can uh, we can look at some videos later on, but um, we have this long-term data which tells us who's alive and who who dies through time. And from that, we can start to look at what influences whether or not individuals survive. Um, very much in the same way that an insurance company might might look to see uh, life expectancy based on whether or not people smoke or whether or not they uh, have high risk activities um, can predict lifespan we can we can actually look to see how the social structure of the group influences whether how long individuals will live, uh, are alive so I said before we were going to look at some of these uh, figures that, that look quite similar to this. So again, sorry, the text is quite close. We have survival here on what we call the, the y-axis, so the up y-axis on the graph. And we have uh, years, how old an individual is along the bottom of the graph. And so you've seen something like this before. So uh, male offspring having a lower survival than female offspring, so males dying at a younger age than females, so females living longer than males. But what we're able to do with this data is ask, well, do these old grandmothers help keep their group alive? So do they help keep their offspring alive? And what the way we can do this is by looking at what happens if one of them dies, and how does that influence the survival of their family members, of their group members, particularly in this case, their offspring. And 
So by, by using these statistics, we can start to, as a way of analyzing the data, we can look at what happens in this case if a mother dies when the offspring is aged 15. And you can see this line now drops. So these males have a lower chance of survival if their old post-reproductive mother dies. But that actually increases and it becomes even greater for old males. So in this case here, if a male is 35 years old, when his mother dies, let me just click this slide on, the chances of him dying increase around eight times. So these old females are actually keeping their adult sons alive. And so this, the fact that this line, this would be the line where they would have their mother alive. And this is the line here if their mother dies when they are 30 years old. And you can see it drops, their survival crashes. And so these old females actually play a really, really crucial part in keeping their adult sons and daughters alive. This is the plot for daughters here. And you can see that the effect in the females and the daughters is not just big. If, a, if an old female dies, yes, the hazard of, a, of, a young, of their daughter increases, but not as much as the hazard uh, for a male. I can see a question coming in from uh, a school, but it's not come through yet, so I will answer that when it comes in. Okay, so what we've managed to show, uh, what is the post group? Ah, that's a really, really, really good question. And when we, so what, I'll read the question out in case you can't see it. So what is it that post reproductive females do to enhance that survival? And so this, this paper was published in 2012 in Science, uh, which is a, a really great journal to communicate our work in. And we were scratching our heads, asking ourselves that exact same question. How on earth could these females be uh, keeping their family group alive? And I, I'm pleased to say we know part of the answer to that, and that's going to be on the next slides. I'm going to flick through that slide in the interest of time. So the next question is exactly the question that, that's come in. How do these post-reproductive females help? And something that's really incredible about these whales is just how specialized they are in their diets. So 85% of their diet is made up of one species of salmon, Chinook salmon. It's incredibly specialized. And this salmon, isn't always there. It varies. These salmon, I don't know how much of you, you guys know about salmon, but salmon have a very interesting life cycle where they spend some of the time out at sea and then they swim into the interesting life cycle where they spend some of the time out at sea and then they swim into the rivers to spawn. They spawn, the young mature in the river for a short time period and then they go back out to sea to grow again. And what that means is that salmon is variable in how abundant it is through time. When the salmon are running into a particular river, there's, there's abundance of food, but not all rivers have salmon going to them at the same time, and salmon varies a lot uh, from year to year. So our idea, which we would call a hypothesis, was that one thing that these females may be doing is actually enhancing the survival of their group by knowing when and where to find salmon. So leading their group around these foraging grounds to help them find the salmon. And we were actually able to test that idea by using this long-term data. So I'm going to show you another video now uh, where we looked at leadership. So let me just see uh, which one it is. I think it's this. Hopefully it's this um, video here. And I'm just going to click on a little bit here. And so Emma Foster, who is a PhD student, me, who really got me excited about these whales, and she was the first person who I started working with when she was a student with me. She coded over, that means we, she watched over 500 hours of video. And in those videos, if I click back again, she recorded which whale was out in the front. And we can see here this whale is out in the front. These individuals are following. 
And from all of that data, we are actually able to look at who is leading the group, L85 in this case, we know them all individually, who's leading the group around these foraging grounds. So this is a group of whales swimming very close to the center of whale research where we started. So we can ask who's leading the group around. So if you imagine, if you were to go to a new town or a new village or a new city, and someone was to lead you around the town and lead you around the streets, they could do this by, by being in front of you and by leading you around. And actually, you could follow them and find your way to the shop or to the hotel or to the swimming pool or wherever else you're wanting to go. We can look at these, these old females and whether or not they're leading the group around these foraging grounds. So let's go back to our slides. I'm going to click on again. Here we are. So um, from that, we were able to produce what we call a social network of leadership. And I'm sure you're all on Facebook and Twitter and uh, very familiar with the concept of a network because you're all embedded in a social network. Um, in, a, in the way of drawing these networks, the individuals here are the nodes, the, the dots, and the bigger the dot, the larger the individual. Oh, sorry, the bigger the dot, the older the individual. And um, they're color-coded here, so these are males and these are females, and these uh, dark pink dots here are the old post-reproductive females, and you can see because they are bigger. And the lines that go from this, that go from here to here, means that this individual was following this individual. So from knowing who's following whom, we can actually start to look at who are the influential uh, leaders in the population. Who, who are the individuals that get followed the most? And we can plot a, a graph that allows us to visualize this. So here is a um, measure of leader of um, the uh, account of how many times, what proportion of females were leading. And here on the x-axis, on this axis, time spent leading. And the pink here is for female, and the blue here is for males. And so what you can see here is that the females spend more time being leaders than the males. So females are really important in leading the group around the foraging ground. But that wasn't quite our question. We were interested in asking whether or not these old females lead more than the young females. So we could split the data further to look at that. So if we compare these post-reproductive females, so that's these dark pink females with these light females, we can see that they have a much higher leadership score than the light pink females. So it's these old females that are actually leading their group around to find food. And that's absolutely incredible. I mean, that really is really is an important finding to be able to show that it's, it's these old individuals that are really acting as stores or repositories, we could call, for, for knowledge and for information of where to find salmon. And the, the group is benefiting from that by these females leading them around to find food. What's interesting about the salmon is that it's not stable, that if we look at this key salmon that forms most of the, the diet of the whales, and here we have year, year along the bottom of the graph, and here we have an abundance measure on this side, on the y-axis of the graph, on this upright here, we can see that salmon abundance between years is very, very variable. And we know that in these years of low salmon, so 96 and 2000 here, this really is a crucial time period for the whales, and this is when the whales are dying. So low salmon is really a, really a driver of mortality. These whales die in years of low salmon. So what we did is asked whether or not the females change their leadership, change their behavior, change their following behavior as well, depending on how much food there is in the environment. So we'd actually expect these are the years in which Make females should be really uh, leading their family around when food is in short supply. And in these years here where food is in plentiful supply, perhaps those old females are not quite as important to their family group. And um, I know I'm showing you a lot of graphs and, and hopefully uh, you're, you're able to follow them and, and follow what the important findings are in here. This uh, insert here in the graph, so this little graph in the top right corner, 
just is the abundance of salmon. So that's just showing you the natural variation in salmon through time. On the bottom of this big plot here, we have salmon abundance, which is just shown graphically here by these pictures of salmon. So at this side of the graph, salmon is in short supply. At this side of the graph, there's plenty of salmon. So that's just measuring the abundance of salmon. And on this axis, on this uh, side of the graph, going up and up on the uh, left here, we have the leadership school. And what we've done in this graph is separate out reproductive females and post-reproductive females. And we can ask whether or not the leadership school differs depending on how much salmon there is in the environment, because we know how much salmon there is. It's interesting, actually, where this salmon data comes from. So this is from uh, standardized, what we call test fisheries, where the same nets are put out at the same time every year, and they record how many salmon they catch and what size those salmon are. So it's a very standardized way of sampling, and that's how we get our salmon data. But we can ask whether or not the leadership score changes depending on how much salmon there is. So a higher score, a value of one, would mean these uh, females are always the leader of the group. A value of zero would mean they're never the leader of the group. And what we can see here is that the reproductive females, which is this dotted line which goes along here, never change their leadership score depending on how much salmon there is. So they're always leading around 0.3 of the time. So around 30% of the time, these uh, reproductive females are leading the group. What's absolutely fascinating in this data is that when salmon is in short supply, so when, when these whales are at risk of starvation in the population, these post-reproductive females, which is this line, really become the leaders of their group. So they're leading the group more than 50% of the time on average. So this, again, uh, really demonstrates the importance of these females to their group. And interestingly, I'm not going to show you the figure, but the uh, sons follow their mums more than the daughters. So if you remember that previous result where we had um, sons being more dependent on their mothers for survival, well, we know that they, they're more dependent on following their mums around the foraging ground. Just going to click on a slide. And this is, we think this is, is, it can really tell us something about human evolution because if we think back, it's not that long ago that um, we didn't have Google, we didn't have, um, we didn't have a library, we didn't have an encyclopedia that if we wanted to know something, we, we would ask somebody, and actually the person to ask would be the elder in a community, the older individuals, the grandmothers or the grandfathers. And in hunter-gatherer societies, we know that that's still the case. So it's the elders, the older individuals in the population, the old individuals, the grandmothers and grandfathers, that really are seen as being key and important in, in, in knowledge and in wisdom in where to find food or where to find water if there's a drought or how to resolve a social conflict. So we think that there's a lot of similarity here between the killer whales and humans, which we find absolutely fascinating. And we would have never imagined that we were going to be able to look at this uh, all that time ago, uh, well, when Ken started collecting this data. It was never intended that we'd be able to do this type of work. It's really emerged from this really unique long-term study that we've been able to do this. And I just want to see if we can play another, another video here. And this work has had quite a lot of coverage in the media. I think we've got time to do this. So hopefully you're going to be able to see this. I'm just going to play you this. This is uh, coverage on BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Corporation, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. It's the main uh, news channel in the UK, but it also produces the BBC World Service, which goes out globally. Uh, so I'm just going to play this to you because this is some coverage that we had on the work. And it will show you some whales as well, and hopefully there will be some sound. Although the sound uh, doesn't actually appear to be working, so I'll talk through the video. So here you can see us out on the boat. This is Ken uh, collecting data using uh, pho uh, photographs. Here we can see a male just uh, coming up. And this is Ken and I uh, with the presenter actually talking about 
the strong social bond that we see between mothers and their offspring. And it really is incredible. So we will see the, the male here coming up and quite often they'll be moving in really, really tight groups here. So when I say that the sons and daughters don't disperse and they really stay with their mother, they really are often observed swimming side by side. And actually we know that these um, old females feed their adult offspring as well. I can actually hear this video. Um, I'm sorry if I'm talking over it, but I'm going to pause it because I don't think the sound is, is working on here. Um, oh, I can see the. Oh, we can hear it, but very low. Okay. Well, um, I, I, what I can do is I can, uh, I can give people a link to where they can watch this video. Actually, if you want to watch this video after we finish talking, or after I finish talking, I'm the one doing the talking. Uh, if you just do a search on YouTube for Darren Croft and Killer Whale, I've made all these videos and some other videos as well available on YouTube. So you can actually go and you can have a listen to this and you can have a look at the media coverage of the work, which gives a nice summary of uh, what we've been doing and why we think it's so interesting. I want to uh, close this video and go back to my slides. Okay, so uh, the last part of this is really why do females stop reproducing? And again, this was a point at which really we were scratching our heads. And this is really the exciting thing about science is that um, you find one result and it just leads to another question. So we found that these old females can help their family group. Uh, we, we've got some idea of how that they can share this knowledge of where to find salmon. But we were still really puzzled as to why on earth should they stop reproducing? Because um, in other animal societies, so if we think about elephants, for example, we know that these old matriarchs, so these old female elephants, are really important to helping their group survive. They are able to recognize predators. They know where to find water in times of drought. They also know how to, um, how to respond to other social groups so the groups don't get caught up in fighting. So these old elephants also have this knowledge which helps their family groups survive. Now, elephants, we know, keep reproducing until the end of life. So why on earth, we were thinking, should these females stop reproduction? And we're, again, we're able to turn to the literature on humans, so to research on humans, to hypotheses, to, to predictions for why menopause, why humans, why women have stopped reproduction early, and test these ideas using this really unique long-term data set from these killer whales. And this, this is can be quite um, a challenge to, to understand, but, but we're going to try because it's quite important for understanding the science. Now, I want, to try, I want you to try and imagine you're a killer whale, and I want to try and imagine that you're a baby killer whale that's just been born into a group, a female killer whale just being born into a group. And when you're born, your father is not with you because the males mate with females from different groups. So you're born into a group with your mother, but you're born into a group without your father, which means actually you have relatively low relatedness. That's, that's how, much, how many genes we're sharing with males, but high relatedness with females because you share a lot of your genes with your mum, but you, your father isn't around, so you've got low relatedness to males. As females, and I imagine you're a female growing up and you get to 13 or 14 in the killer whale case, then you start to have your own children, your own offspring, your own calves if you're a killer whale. They stay with you because they never disperse. And so what happens is that your relatedness to males increases because your sons stay in your group. So you start off in a group without your dad, without your father, but as you age, the uh, males 
are in your group, the, the sons rather, your offspring, your male offspring, stay in your group. Okay, so this is a, this is a plot which measures the relatedness of individuals to their local group, and this is just a, a measure of time along here. So these are young animals and these are old animals. And this is a prediction of, of how relatedness will change with age. This is looking at relatedness of females to their group. So female, and this is for females and for males, and then this is just when you take these two lines and work out what the average would be, what the middle point is. So the relatedness to females stays constant as females age, but what's really interesting is that the relatedness to males increases as females get older, and that's because their sons are staying in their group. And that means that their average, their, the, the average, the mean relatedness, that females get more related to their local group as they get older. Okay, so why is that so interesting and why is that so important? Now, in many animal groups, uh, animals are both cooperative, that they're helping the group, but also we know there's a lot of conflict in animal societies, that individuals are not just helpful and giving, they're cooperative, they're also competing and trying to get a bigger slice of the pie, trying to get access to more resources. For example, if we think about chicks in a nest, then siblings, brothers and sisters, will actually push, in some species, will actually push their brother or sister out of the nest in order to try and get more food. So in families in, and animals, quite often it's not a harmonious life. There's competition in the group. Ah, I can see Charles has joined us. Fantastic, Charles. Uh, and what we can see here is happening is that um, as individuals are getting older, they're becoming more related to their group. So from an evolutionary perspective, what that means is actually that younger individuals should be fighting harder to get resources, younger females, and older females, because they're now in a group of their own offspring, particularly their own male offspring, should actually switch from competing to get food to actually helping, uh, because they're more related to their group. So there becomes a tipping point where they should switch from being competitive to being helpful. If that's not clear, or if anyone wants me to go over that again, then please just shout, and I will. Okay, why? And I'm gonna I'm gonna miss that uh, graph of the second graph, just a second, in the interest of time. So, what? Why is this really interesting for for the killer whale story? This change in relatedness as individuals get older. The fact that these old females are more related. There's there are more in, there's more of their genetic material, there's more of their genes in their family group because they've got more of their own offspring there. What happens in the killer whales is that this is just a family tree. So this is, this is a mother, this is a mother, and these are two calves here. What happens is sometimes that mums and daughters try and breed at the same time. And if they do this, they're in what we call conflict or competition because there's only so much salmon to go around, there's only so much food to go around. And these two calves and these two mothers are then competing for that limited resource. Now, if we, go, if we were to go back to the previous slide, our theory, so we were able to do some, some, some quite advanced maths and, and simulate evolution, would predict that these younger females that are less related to their group should fight harder, should compete more for food than these older females. So we'd actually predict that this calf here, which is born to this old female at the same time as this calf, will actually have lower survival. Now, um, using this fantastic long-term data that the sense has been able to collect, we're actually able to test that hypothesis by looking at what happens to the survival of these calves if mothers and daughters try and breed at the same time. Remember what we're interested in doing here is trying to understand why this old female switches off reproduction. So if I, if I just click on now to the next slide, uh, and just to give you an idea of 
just how big and how incredible this data set is that we've been able to use. It spans from 1973 to uh, 2015. So this study started before I was born. I was born in 1975. So it's, it's old. The study's been going old, a, a longer time period than I've been alive, which I think is just absolutely incredible. And it's documented over 500 births of calves from killer whales over that time period from these two populations. So it's really an incredible amount of effort that's gone into collecting this data. And of these, around a third of calves were born from two females, from a mother and daughter, having calves at the same time. So um, I'm, we, we're going to, again, look at these plots. And this is why we spent a bit of time talking about them. These are the same types of plots. So this is survival here. And this is age on the bottom axis. So if we look at a value of one, all individuals are alive. And as we start to drop here, individuals are dying. And the important thing here is these are calves that are born at the same time. And this is the calf. The green line here is the calf from the young mother. And the purple line here is the calf from the old mother. And so when these two calves are born at the same time, the calf from the old mother has a lower chance of survival. And there's an effect of whether or not the calf is born first or born second, or whether it's the older calf or the younger calf. But the, the result is the same, that it's the old females, in this case, this female, the old grandmother, whose calves actually suffer higher mortality rates. But they only do that when they're born into this competition. If we look at this when they're breeding on their own, then there's no difference in the survival of their calf to a calf that uh, to the calves of young females. It's only when they are breeding at the same time is the is the survival of these calves lower. Okay, so if I just click on uh, a slide and uh, I'm in the interest of time, given we have to wrap up in uh, eight minutes. I'm again going to point you to my YouTube, I say my YouTube channel, but if you, there's not a lot on there, but if you go to there, you can watch a, a BBC News uh, broadcast about that work, and it helps to integrate and explain why this is important for understanding human evolution. And the interesting thing there, the absolutely fascinating thing there, is we think that exactly the same uh, conflict between uh, old and young females was important in ancestral human societies as it is in the killer whales. So by understanding these killer whales and why menopause has evolved in killer whales, we can learn something about why this has evolved in humans as well, which uh, is really exciting. And, and we would have never actually thought that the, the long, this long-term study would have led to those findings when it started out over 40 years ago. I'm going to skip over there. And I want to tell you about what we want to do next. So what we want to do next, actually, is um, if we go back to the video just really quickly, and let's just see this video here again, and we'll just look at what we're seeing here are whales from the side. And we've been able to learn an incredible amount from this type of data. Uh, there was the baby whale, the, the young calf, just jumping up there. So we've been able to learn the baby whale, the, the young calf just jumping up there. So we've been able to learn a lot about the animals by studying them from this perspective. But it's what we'd say uh, two-dimensional in that, in that we're, we're, we're not able to get a, uh, well, two-dimensional two from the side, but we're not actually able to see what's going on underwater. We're only actually able to see what's going on uh, above water. Now, if we uh, start to think about using um, aerial video collected from drones, which is what we're hoping to do this summer, is actually fly these drones over the whales, which, which we know causes very little disturbance to the whale. They're, they're not actually able to hear this when they're underwater. Um, we can start to actually see the behavior of the animals when they're under the water. So here we can see a calf. These photos are, uh, are taken from uh, Noah's work, where they've been photographing the whales using a drone. Here we can see a calf feeding from a mother. We wouldn't be able to see that by looking from the side. 
Here we can see two animals bumping heads, and that's very interesting to us as to as to what is that, you know, friendly or is it a, a bit of tug of war, a bit of aggression? And we can actually start to see how animals are positioned in the group. So how, how they're coordinating their behavior, also how they're possibly sharing food when they catch that salmon. So by doing this, we're actually hoping to be able to get a much better insight into their behavior. Now, I'm aware I've talked for quite a long time. A couple of questions have come in, but um, I just want to pause a minute because there's only five more minutes left to see if anyone wants to um, fire a question at me. Um, or if you guys have been thinking about why you think this might be important for conservation, feel free to fire ideas over. Um, but if I don't see anyone typing, I will tell you why I think it's important for conservation over the last few minutes. But I will just see, ah, we can see a question or comment coming in. So I think it is very important for conservation. Um, and I think it's very important. And I think by understanding this, um, we can hopefully really start to make uh, and help the conservation efforts for these whales. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the news, but it's very sad that so many have died over the last 12 months. What, what does, does global warming affect the whale's swimming pattern? So um, in, in, terms of the, in terms of the temperature of the, of the animals, um, it probably isn't, isn't going to have a huge impact on the, on the whales themselves because they're going to experience quite a large variation in temperature by swimming from shallow to deep water. What it will have an impact on, though, is the abundance of their prey, uh, and particularly of their, of their salmon. But the, the more, what the biggest worry is around um, the future of these killer whales is, is not so much uh, global warming and a change in sea temperature, but the abundance of salmon and the abundance of their prey. But actually, um, in, terms of, in terms of understanding their, their behavior, what, what we're able to show is just how valuable these old females are. So it's a great shame that we lost J2. And J2 was the oldest whale in this population, who was uh, possibly 100 years old or more, but certainly over 80. And by losing that whale, we actually also lost knowledge, and we lost the information that that whale had. And that will come as a cost to the population. I think it's so it's so the question just come in, is it important that we make policy changes based on based on the needs of the animal? And and absolutely it's really important that we make policy changes based on the needs of these animals. And um, these animals really have become specialized and become specialized to feed on salmon and, and one species of salmon in particular. And specialization uh, is often a really, really bad thing for animals. We think of pandas as being endangered. And one of the reasons they're endangered is because they're so specialized in what they eat, they're eating bamboo. And killer whales are similar. These killer whales are similar in some extent. That they've become specialized to feed on uh, a species of salmon. So we need, we really need to change policy to make sure they've got enough food to eat. And how do you, how do you, the, Everyone. How do you do that when everyone owns the ocean? So there is this really big problem that actually the ocean is a common ground and a common fishing area. And actually, there is something called the tragedy of the commons in economics. And so that's understanding how business and market works. And if you think if everyone shared a bank account, and I said to you all, there's $1,000 in a bank account, and you've all got a card, and you can all withdraw some money. Um, but when the money's gone, it's gone. The first person to the bank would probably take all thousand, all all one thousand dollars out, and that's what's happened to fish in the sea. That because it's a shared resource, that actually people exploit that resource and have taken more than a sustainable share. So what's really important is actually getting people together and including whales in that story and making sure they have a share and everyone's got to work together in order to conserve the ocean. And that, having that collective and, and actually understanding that, that we all have a role to play is, is ultimately how we're going to be able to get there. Now, I'm aware my clock is about to tick over uh, to, in the UK, to 6 o'clock. 
and that will be to one o'clock for many of you. Um, but I'm happy to take any more questions. Um, but I'm aware many of you are going to log out now to go on to uh, a different seminar. But thank you very much for listening. It's been a real pleasure talking to you all. It's the first time I've done a webinar, so it's it's slightly different uh, just talking to myself and seeing myself on a screen. But hopefully you're able to understand some of the things I was talking about. And please, if you have any questions, email me. If you do a search for Darren Croft, University of Exeter, then you'll be able to find me. And I'm more than happy to uh, follow up with emails. Or if you have anything else, uh, we can find another way of talking. But please, if you have any questions, get back to me. And I will, I, I will, um, I will do my best to answer any more questions. Okay, thank you guys, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day as well. I, I, it looks like a really exciting lineup of talks, and thank you so much for inviting me to do this. It's been a real pleasure to be able to talk to you all about this work and about the whales, and, and about why I find science so exciting as well, uh, and why, it's, why it really is so, so important that we all play a role in protecting these animals. <laughs>